Hey guys, welcome to the wonderful world of Remnant Radio. Today we are doing our Wednesday show that we call To Be Continued, where we discuss the gifts of the Spirit. Today we're going to be tackling, we're going to be doing a response to the Mars Hill podcast, a specific episode called Demon Hunting. It's going to be an excited, ep- exciting episode. You guys stay tuned. The tongue ties. We should talk about tongues. <laughs> we were watching the Remnant Radio, a crowd of show where we interview pastors, teachers, historians, and theologians from different churches and denominations. My name is Joshua Lewis, and this is my co-host, Michael Roundtree. Together, we want to help you break outside of your theological echo chambers. If you're interested in learning about history, theology, or the gifts of the Spirit, this is the show for you. I really hope you guys let us know if y'all can hear some of the stuff we say to each other when that video plays. <laughs> Jeez Louise. Okay, guys. Uh, this is going to be uh, a great episode. It's not inappropriate. It's not inappropriate. It's not, They're yeah. just like, but, Michael, I could hear you breathing on your microphone. Like, just weird <laughs> stuff. Like, in the intro video. I guess I did make it sound like it was bad. Okay. We're talking about the Mars Hill Podcast, but before we do that, I want to remind you that we're an entirely crowdfunded ministry. Your donations keep this ministry afloat. So the lights, the cameras going out to Kentucky to film with Dr. Craig Keener, those kinds of things cost money, and your support makes it all happen. So we want to thank you first and foremost for it. And if you're interested in supporting, there are links in the description for both PayPal or Patreon. You can give on PayPal as a one-time gift or Patreon to be a reoccurring donor. As low as five bucks a month, you can get extra content on Patreon. Awesome. Like that? Yeah, cool. absolutely. And uh, please make sure you hit that subscribe button, like, comment, share, engage. and uh, But subs- uh, subscribe especially because we have a lot of great episodes coming up. Uh, we have one next week with Elisa Childers. She is coming back on the show. She wrote a book called Another Gospel a little while ago. And a uh, great book talking about progressive Christianity and some of the false doctrines. So next week on Monday, we're going to be talking, is it Monday? Monday. Mm-hmm. Uh, we'll be talking about three specific false teachers. Well, Elisa says we're, so they're false teachers. We're going to find out. Uh, Brian Zond, Peter Inns, Pete Inns, and Richard Rohr. Would it's, any of us have a issue with? Those? No, okay, no. We're, I, we're okay. You well, made it sound like, oh, we don't know okay, if they're I, false teachers. Yes, I, I do think they're false, but I. <laughs> I wanted to leave a little suspense, Josh. If you tell them what everything is going to be on the show, they're not going to watch it. I feel like I'd take this clip and be like, Michael's not sure. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Okay. No. Okay. Cat out of the bag. I think they're false teachers. All right. Excellent. So more on that next week. Hey, um, we got a we got a good suggestion down there in the comments about praying before we dive into this topic. I think that's actually a great idea. Agreed. Okay. And well, while we, we pray did for just, that. We did just pray before we dove into this topic, but... We'll do it again. Yeah, I we'll know. Pray for Michael's for Wi-Fi. It <laughs> okay. does not look great. Go, go, Miller. Oh, buddy. Go ahead. Uh, do, do yeah, your prayers Jesus. get stuck in the basement? Do they? Okay, no, <laughs> let them pray. Stuck. Leave me alone. Uh, Lord, thank you so much uh, for these guys uh, and all the banter. I ask that we, despite all that, we would have a lot of fun, but we would also tackle real issues, and we'd be able to tackle this one in a delicate manner that meets people where they're at. We ask that this would uh, bless everybody who hears it, and that we would be blessed in the uh, doing of this podcast and this discussion. Thank you for everything. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Yeah, we want to, in this podcast, make sure that we're not condoning sin, brushing things under the rug that took place that were wrong. But at the same time, uh, we don't want to overemphasize things and make a mountain out of a molehill. Uh, We want to have just scales and be able to call balls and strikes on specific issues. Uh, Maybe we should start by just saying, what is the the rise and fall of the Mars Hill, the podcast? Uh, What are our thoughts on it? Has it been beneficial or harmful to the discussion of Mars Hill? Uh, moving forward, before we dive specifically into this episode on demon hunting, uh, I'll start. You know, start with Michael here, okay, and then we'll, sure. we'll do Michael over uh, there. Next. I mean, Rise and Fall of Mars Hill. I think it's one of the top five podcasts right now. Uh, I I do think that it has been beneficial as a learning experience for the body of Christ on things not to do. Uh, that that's definitely. I I think that it has been beneficial in that regard. Um, I I do personally think that complementarians have been portrayed in a bad light. Uh, I don't think that was necessarily intentional, but, uh, but I do think that, um, that that's true. And, uh, as far as like Mark Driscoll controversy and, and all of that, I would just say things that Mark Driscoll did, uh, pre 2011 or pre whenever the fall was, um, it, it definitely was very abusive, very bad. Um, I can't really speak to where Mark's at today. I don't know Mark. Yeah. Uh, so I, I can't speak to that. But I, I can say that back then, there was a lot of abuse. Yeah. And um, I, I'm interested in what Miller's thoughts are. We, we did a video with Miller on Fired from the NAR uh, where there was, uh, we talked about your experience with an unhealthy ecclesiology 
that that just means the way the church is governed. And uh, for those of you who don't know what the word ecclesiology means, but the, the church governments, how the church runs, and uh, that process caused a lot of pain and wounding uh, for Miller, uh, our co-host there in the basement in Denver. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, this podcast spoke to a lot of those issues. Has this been a helpful podcast for you to listen to, Miller, uh, as you're processing through what happened to you uh, in, in your former church? Yeah, I'd say for both my wife and I, it's been incredibly helpful. Um, I, I've loved the podcast. Granted, I can see so much of my own story in it. Uh, I specifically, the the little 15-minute episode they did on the, uh, the origin and how an origin story of a church or a ministry can make it sound so much more mythic than it actually is. And it makes it more about that church than it is about the gospel transforming lives. And I can see that completely in my own story. And then some of the stuff from the, the episode we're going to talk about today, specifically when he, when he rails on uh, women for gossip and just how to, that's sort of the assumption uh, in this podcast, but I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, overall, the, um, it's been, I would say, very therapeutic. I would say doing that podcast was good for me in a, in a sense, just looking back on it, because I think I you know, was able to find my voice again and be able to share the story without feeling uh, the weight of it all. And uh, that, I think that's part of a process when you've come out of an abusive environment is you're able to find your voice again. And I think that's what's happening in the telling of the story. A lot of the people from Mars Hill uh, have found their voice, and they're talking about their story. And uh, I would imagine... Uh, it, you know, many people who watch can find their story in their story as well. So I, I, I've loved what we've seen so far. Um, I've got a lot of positive things to say about it. Oh, I got to mute myself. Yeah, I would say my, my overall experience with the podcast has been uh, good. Uh, there was a specific podcast that I didn't care to, for too much. Uh, Michael said that the complementarians have been put in bad light. I would say that the complementarian position was probably mischaracterized. I would go as far to say that. Uh, for, it's, I would agree with that. The, the Mars Hill is claiming the, the the Mars Hill the rise and fall of Mars Hill podcast is claiming to be journalism, um, and it's I would say it's journalism. It's just biased journalism, and I would have preferred it to be a little bit less biased on that specific subject. They interviewed a bunch of egalitarians that spoke into specific issues where the, those same issues every complementarian I know would also have condemned it. So it made it sound like egalitarians defend women. And complementarians which, this was a very don't, common criticism. which is a very common criticism during that podcast. So, so I would say overall, I think that with that one exception out of the way, I would say that that one, um, uh, that one criticism out of the way that, that the, the podcast has been overwhelmingly helpful. I would also want to say that, that this was took place a decade ago. Okay. Mark is a different guy. I'm not defending him in that. I'm just saying all of us 10 years ago have become or different people. Or he might be a different guy. Uh, I mean, Lord willing, what we hear in that podcast is not becoming of a pastor. Um, it was sinful. It wasn't right. We don't want to pretend like it was. But I also realize that this kind of conversation, there is a, an actual pastor right now who's actually caring for a local church, and he has a family and children who could watch this. And, and I think we also need to be careful in the way that we speak of this, not knowing where he is now, not knowing his family now, but speaking of what happened 10 years ago. So let's yeah, let's that, separate this a little bit and give some room. That's precisely why I wanted to make that qualification at the beginning that, yeah, all the stuff then, that was really bad. I won't say all the stuff. Much of the stuff then was bad, but we don't know where he's at now. Sure. I'm mindful of the fact that he is a pastor and that he has a family. And uh, and so I don't want to pile it on when I don't actually have any idea where Mark is at right now. Sure. So, uh, okay. So uh, if you want to watch that episode with Michael Miller about his church abuse, if you think you might be experiencing some, ch some church abuse, I encourage you, look up Remnant Radio Fired <laughs> from NAR Church. That's the name of the episode. NAR stands for New Apostolic Re Reformation. And uh, you need to listen to Miller's story there. Really powerful. Let's jump into this specific episode of The Rise and Fall of Mars Hill, which is titled Demon Hunting. And, uh, and so it's criticizing some of the charismatic practices at Mars Hill. And so we're, we're not going to be looking at this from the angle of, uh, was Mark Hill, or, or Mark Hill... <laughs> Mark Driscoll. The a, title's a long title. Mixing him up a bit. It's, it's, <laughs> yeah, a, it's a really long title. Mar the and Mark Rise Driscoll. and Fall of Pars, right, so. Mars Hill. I said Pars Hill just now. <laughs> so uh, was we're not really asking the question, was Mark Driscoll abusive in the way he cast out demons or something like that? That's a lot the question that, that Mike Cosper of Rise and Fall of Mars Hill was asking. 
What we're getting at is what are best practices? What can we learn from what was described? Do we agree or disagree with the way charismatics were represented? I think that's where we're, we want to start out. Sure. Uh, and, and I just saw it when I woke up this morning and Twitter world was blowing up with all these charismatics being like, whoa, whoa, rise and fall on Mars Hills, criticizing all the charismatics, says a bunch of charismatics are terrible, blah, blah, blah. You know, We believe in fairies. Yeah, and we believe in fairies, which would have been in the introduction of the episode. So um, anyway, I think let's start with that question. And I don't even know that the three of us agree on the answer to it. But uh, do you feel that charismatics were mischaracterized, misrepresented by the recent episode on demon hunting? Uh, Josh or Michael? Actually, I don't care. Whoever Miller, I'll, well, I'll let you start, man. Yeah, sure. So um, I loved the episode. Uh, there was there were things I disagreed with, but there's always things you disagree with in, in everything you listen to in podcasts and sermon and whatnot. Um, I don't necessarily think that the criticisms that are coming the way from charismatics are entirely fair. I think they might have missed the point. Um, like I do, I can see how the paralleling of the story of uh, the the fairies with certain practices of casting out demons sort of get put together. Um, but the very fact that they bring Sam on, Sam Storms at the end, who we've had on the podcast numerous times to talk about this very issue of casting out demons and spiritual warfare, uh, I think uh, the very fact that he is on the show brings balance to it to show, hey, we're not saying this is all bad. We're saying there was some, some stuff going on here at, at Mars Hill that is very bad. And sometimes when we want to believe something is true, uh, we can latch on to things that actually aren't true. And I think that's sort of the point of the fairy analogy at the very beginning. But I can, I can understand why people would walk away going, oh, he's saying that casting out demons is no different than believing in fairies. Well, Michael, and, uh, yeah. Uh, can, you, can you bring us to that fairy analogy? Where was he going with that fairy analogy? Uh, what do I think the point of, of that in there was? Yeah, what was it? Just is for it, our viewers who didn't see it, um, what, what was happening in that? Uh, I don't know if I could tell it right. Maybe you could help okay, me out okay, with this. Sure. Yeah, um, I mean, it's Mary Woodworth yeah. Eddy, uh, like documents it and others. There was these young girls who went out and took photos of these fairies. This dad's like, you're not playing with fairies, fairies outside. Yeah. And they're like, yeah, we're playing with fairies outside. And they went out and took a photo. They, they were playing with like paper dolls as they had put in the trees and hung in the trees and took a photo and it looked convincing. And this photo had been like taken all over the place. And later on when these girls are like 80, For decades, you know, people believed there were real fairies it, because of this. Yeah, it was it was propagating a cult movement is what it was doing. And uh, someone comes to the, these girls, young girls that are now in their 80s and says, hey, you know, did this actually happen? And they responded, no, it's it's all a lie. It was a hoax don't you feel bad for it? And they're like, no, I don't feel bad for it. Like we gave some people something to believe in. And the idea is not that um, the supernatural world is a hoaxy little thing that is being held up by straw men, the proverbial straw men, uh, but that the, uh, the, the correlation is that people want to believe something and that we are giving them something to believe in. And the kind of illustration that was being brought about is that Mark Driscoll, um, was saying things my, my assumption about, about healing visions and demons prophecy and casting out demons that was actually hurting people and causing them to believe things that weren't true that seemed to be the correlation that was being picked and there's a quote in here that i feel clearly illustrates that at best he's saying that mark driscoll is a liar you have the quote readily uh, available? yeah i have it. okay why don't yeah, you pull absolutely. it up and i'll and i'll make a comment while you're looking that up uh because uh, I, you know, I had mixed feelings oh. about whether, is my mic on? <laughs> no, you're not your face. <laughs> okay. Anyway, I had mixed feelings about whether charismatics were characterized appropriately. Um, the end of the episode was awesome. And yeah. and I think that the way you end the episode is the most important because I, I think that re that reflects kind of, this is what I'm driving home. And he interviewed Sam Storms and Sam got the longest interview of anybody and uh, and Probably Sam ever on was portrayed as a balanced charismatic, yeah. and Mike Cosper gave credence to the charismatic movement and just said some people believe these things, and we can debate that and in, in, in house and that kind of deal. So that's how it ended. So I felt much better about it at the end. But I will say at the beginning when he opened with a story about fairies, and that story was perfectly juxtap juxtapositioned with charismatics believe a lot of crazy things now he didn't use those exact words but that seemed to be the intended correlation correlation 
And then I'll also add this one. Uh, he he has some expert, I can't remember who it was, but somebody talking about Frank Peretti and he came out with this fiction book and the fiction book uh, talked about spiritual warfare and spiritual realities and angels and demons. And uh, But it, since it was fiction, the, what the person said specifically was the, f uh, the fiction caused people to suspend their unbelief and to open themselves up to certain charismatic practices. Mm -hmm. And my response is, What's wrong with that? What's wrong with someone being open up to what the Bible actually says we should be open to? Yep. So I think, now, I don't think it was necessarily intended as a criticism, um, but it was. Yeah. Yeah, so. let, me, let me read this quote for you guys. I had a hard time reading it earlier, but I'm going to try to muscle through it, okay? Uh, where is the line between the hand of God and uh, the charisma of a gifted leader? How do we know when our instinct for our sh astonishment is being manipulated or to think, uh, of the nefarious for a moment, how do we know? Uh, how do we know the difference between spirits that are just beyond our sight and paper dolls? In the end, what's what's the limiting principle? Uh, when do we accept the claims of someone speaking on God's behalf, and when do we draw the line? So here in this quote, he's he is seeming to say there are claims, charismatic claims of a charismatic leader that is being stated as factual, just like the paper dolls are being claimed as factual fairies. Um, and we should have some regulative principle or some way of discerning to say that's not true. That being said, Mark was telling stories of people that he had prayed for, that had demons that got delivered. This is on the heels of that. Um, visions that he had had of people having uh, 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 affairs, uh, sexual immorality, and these would cause him to confront these people. He talked about chairs in his office levitating. And the idea, that the response in to this guy... In a demonic guy, manifestation kind of... Kind of way, yeah. yeah. So the, the response to this guy is, this sounds like dolls in a tree. This seems too good to be true. This seems so supernatural that it it, it can't be possible. And, and maybe that's a stretch I'm putting words in his mouth. Go watch the podcast for yourself. That quote, I think, is pretty concerning in that if I'm a charismatic and I'm going after God's word casting out demons, healing the sick, um, and actual demonic manifestations are things I th see in the Bible and I've seen in my day-to-day -day life, not every day, life and practice. There's not chairs floating every time I walk into a, a service <laughs> and some demons dude. start ah, and floating chairs. <laughs> Another floating chair. Ah, just floating chairs everywhere. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to push back a little bit on this just because um, I think the, the point that they were making was not so much about all charismatic practices being unbelievable, unbelievable, and should be carte blanche written off. I don't think that was his intention at all. I think the point was to show you that you've already got a person who's got a history of expanding the truth, um, of exaggeration. You know, his origin story did that in spades. You know, how things changed and how it's impossible to start a church in Seattle and baptize this many people, and and just uh, and how his own calling into ministry. Over time, it changed. That story, you know, the fish got bigger and bigger and bigger. And so then you've got this, this same guy who is so dynamic and so sure of everything he says um, that that is where things get confusing. Uh, we don't know what to believe about this guy, uh, much like we don't, you know, people would latch on to the story of fairies. So again, I, I don't think that was Cosper's intent was to to cause us to question charismatic practice in, in a general sense, but rather to cause us to question the, the, the uh, claims of somebody who's already rather unreliable. Yeah, yeah and I don't, I, don't, I don't entirely disagree with you, Michael. I think, I, I, Cosper, reach out to us and we'll have a discussion. I don't mind doing that at all. Um, but when it, when it comes to this kind of thing, um, there's another statement in here um, that I think it feeds into it feeds into the discussion that we're having because you're saying, hey, we're going to take um, Mark's word that these supernatural things are happening where it seems like he's embellishing the truth on these kind of normative, natural, like, oh, God grew the church. People were getting saved. They were getting baptized. Like, this is impossible if God's hand wasn't on it, kind of endorsing everything that you're doing so that when bad things happen, you can be like, look what God's doing in the midst of it. Ignore the bad. Look at the good, right? Um, that That's the kind of argumentation that you're making. But like there's a there's a section in here where Mark is counseling um, uh, a wife and her husband, 
And in this section, uh, you know, the, the wife has absolutely no evidence. She's got, there's no story of why she thinks this is the case, but she has these massive panic attacks every time her husband goes to work, thinking that he's off having an affair and cheating on her. And then he looks to the husband and says, hey, you know, uh, are you cheating on her? No. Are you committing adultery? No. Are you looking at pornography? No. Are you, you know, touching women? Are you pursuing women? Are you emotionally involved? And, and the response is, no, I'm going to work and I'm coming home. And, and then he looks at the, the, the young lady and, you know, says, you, you got to stop believing the lie. You should repent of this. Um, she repents. And according to the story, she gets free. She stops having panic attacks. Um, now, in the story, the narration after the story was, do you see, like, this is the, the, the naive woman trope. That, that women are just unstable and men have to come in and they have to fix them and they have to like help them believe what's right. We've got to fix all their emotionalism. And look how he took the word of the man here. You know, he just took his word as gospel truth and kind of, you know, called her sweet, you know, or, or you know, patronized her with some kind of pet name. And I was like, well, what was he supposed to do? Like, was he supposed to look at the woman and be like, hey, like your suspicion has no data or validity whatsoever. You've got no evidence, no proof. I'm just going to, I'm going to take your word over his. Like she's admitting that she's is coming to this, this counseling session with anxiety attacks for something that isn't based in reality. Um, and, and here's this guy that he's also counseling. who's like, this is what is true. So what's he, what kind of decision is he supposed to make in that given situation? It, it seems to me that the podcast is Mark Driscoll did bad things of which I will say, yes, yes, he did. There was abuse. But now it's like an attempt to see abuse in everything. Let's look at the abuse in all these charismatic practices. Here's a story of him counseling someone where they got freedom and they were completely delivered. Let's find the abuse. It's like, I don't think that story has abuse. I think that story is awesome. There was a girl who was oppressed. She's not oppressed anymore. And I mean, I, I would... Wait, was I would, this Jen at the beginning of the episode? The one who... Different, different person. Different person. Okay. Yes. I'm thinking of a different... Okay. Yeah. So this this was a, a girl who was having panic attacks who came in with her husband and confessed that she was having these panic attacks. Jen was a person who was sitting in the front seat of the car. He got into the car and she was explaining to him what she was going yeah. through. Well, Miller, she, how would Jen's you... been on a lot of the previous episodes as well. That's right. Yeah. Uh, it, <clears throat> Miller, how would you have passed her that situation? Do you feel like... Driscoll handled that fine, or would you have given more credence to the woman than Driscoll did, or what? You mean the woman with the anxiety and the suspicion the, the about her husband? Attacks. Did yeah. you? Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I actually, again, I, I thought that story was a good story. I, I'm kind of with Josh on this one. I didn't see that as abusive. Um, and, and the fact is, there are lies we believe. I personally, I mean, I've shared my own story of strongholds of the mind, things I would make up in my head, especially when I was in a dating relationship about the girl I was dating. And every little thought that came into my head, I believed. And out of that behavior, I would act out. And I also had a panic attack when I had a similar type of paranoid delusion about something going on with an ex-girlfriend. Um, so I, and, and it was demonic. It absolutely was. And I had to walk through a process of changing the way I thought. So, um, I can relate to it firsthand and I, and I could say, look, I, I'm guilty of the same kind of paranoia in the past. I'm not saying that's normative for me today. It's actually not quite normative for me today, but, uh, I, I do see that as uh, a legitimate form of ministry, helping people change the way they think. I mean, that is the idea of tearing down strongholds of the mind. Miller, honest question about your your background, formerly pastor to this church. We talked about being fired from that. We, we brought that up earlier today. Um, mm -hmm. Is I, I know if I were to ask you, was God moving and actually doing things actively in your local church while you were there? Your answer would be a resounding yes. Absolutely. God was working in the midst of that. Do you feel a kind of danger, a desire, if you will, to go, man, because they wronged me in this area like I'm prone to see everything, like I'm a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Is that something that, that you're kind of drawn to, like everything looks abusive now? Uh, was that something that you had to fight and wrestle through yourself? Uh, I'm sure some would accuse me of that. Uh, I don't personally feel that way. I mean, I'm still in ministry. I'm at a church. We're doing conferences together. We're going to be down in Houston uh, teaching on spiritual warfare and tearing down strongholds of the mind. So I'm not prone to see abuse everywhere. Um, I think you know, what's taken me two years, two and a half years, is to actually figure out what was abuse. That was the hardest part, is to begin to go, oh, that right there, yeah, that that's an abusive behavior. Um, especially because when you're in an abusive environment, you get so gaslighted, you think you're the issue. 
Um, and one of the things that I think is worth bringing up when is when they talk about the gossip stuff, how you know you just had two elders leave, uh, you had a thousand people from the church leave, and now um, Driscoll is basically telling women how much they like to gossip. And that's the assumption. Rather than, hey, maybe they're grieving and they're talking about something that was abusive and wrong, and instead of you wanting to own that abuse, you're gaslighting them by calling it gossip. And I experienced something very similar to this. I remember thinking um, one of the accusations I was getting was that I was dishonoring the leader. Now imagine this. I just had several people leave the church that I had been doing ministry with since the very beginning of the church. And I'm trying to process, hey, this doesn't look right. This looks off. But then I'm told, you're dishonoring me. You're talking about me. Uh, and, that, and I mean, you guys remember after the fact how many times I would go, man, maybe I'm just this gossiping, dishonoring person. Um, no, yeah, you're, you're constantly so beginning like, to unpack am I that. on the right here? Did I, did I do something wrong constantly? Yeah. And that's what I'm saying is like, it takes time to identify abuse, especially if you've been gaslighted after being abused. Um, and so I, I don't see that as a propensity. It's just go find abuse everywhere. Maybe that's a, maybe that's a, a potential reality and maybe I'm even guilty of it. I'm not sure. I don't think so though. No, you're good, man. And, and I, I didn't mean to uh, say that you did or assume that you did. I only meant to no, ask, I know. like, is it possible that after being hurt, and wanting to protect people that you're trying to see where all the manipulation is taking place and then assume or kind of have uh after you've been hurt and you've processed through it then go now how do i protect other people and look at, at all these different ministries and all these different tentacles of the christian practice and go it, could that hurt someone or does this hurt someone and like you know get into I, a defensive posture yeah i i think the real danger here is assuming that because there's fruit because you're seeing people get delivered maybe from real demons and you're seeing real healings happen, that because of that fruit, that means the abuse that's also taking place couldn't possibly be taking place. I think that's a greater danger. And I think that so was you're happening saying, in Mars to, to stretch a biblical analogy a little bit, that the wheat and the tares are actually growing up at the same time in Mars Hill. Like there is actually wheat in the midst of this field and there's like good gospel fruit, but in the midst of that, there's also tares that are growing up at the same time. Um, and Absolutely. That, that the good and the good and the evil are both escalating in the same space. Yeah. I think it's fair. Hey I guys, agree. I'm gonna I'm gonna bring this back to conversation about demons because that is what the <laughs> that's true majority of the episode was about. I mean, it was about all the things that you guys are talking about. But um, I mentioned Jen a few moments ago. Jen was brought up at the beginning of the episode, and uh, and she had an experience where you know a pastor's talking, and and he. Uh, he says something really demeaning to pe to people who commit sexual sin, like you idiots kind of deal, something like that. And of course, yeah, she prostitutes get paid yeah, to have she, sex. You're giving so it away she, for free. Uh, gets very emotional about this because she has some sexual history and she feels ashamed. So so she has this intense shame coming over her. Driscoll comes to her and and according to the podcast, this is what Driscoll says: If you just stop believing the lies and believe God's truth, you'd be set free from the demons. And Jen's response later was, maybe he sees something I don't. And then he proceeds to cast out demons. Uh, in the end, she was set free, but she felt slimed by the whole process. It, it, I mean, largely because the original pastor and what he did. Uh, but but I think she also kind of second-guessed the, the way Driscoll went about it. And the episode seemed to me to cast aspersions upon the way that Driscoll went about this, like uh, suggesting she believed in lies instead of truth. So... Uh, I want to ask you guys, uh, you've heard Driscoll's approach here. Is there something that you disagree or find abusive? I mean, obviously what the previous pastor said, like, you Not know, helpful. making fun of people who commit sexual sin, a very, uh, a very bad pastoral mistake. Okay. But then Driscoll addresses shame by going after demons and then confronting lies and truth. Good or bad? I'll start with Miller. Man, that's a tough one. Um, see, all of this, like Cosper even said, is extra biblical. You don't find precedent for some of what's taking place in the scriptures. Um, I remember there was a Charles Craft. He his his ministry model is to ask people questions and let them hear from the demons inside of them to to answer those questions. And I I don't know. I don't practice that. Um, uh, you know, Driscoll also said never address a demon. I'm like. 
but Jesus did address demons, like quite clearly in scriptures. Um, so I, I just don't know. I, I could say that. I think there probably yeah. is. Go ahead. <laughs> oh, it, it took Josh a minute to unmute me. I was. Uh, oh. It's too late now. But Acts sixteen. I was going to say Acts sixteen. Paul commands. It says, "I command you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, come out of her uh, to a demon." So. Well, I think specifically what I heard him say was Mar Mark said in his video, "Don't talk to demons," and I think what he's speaking to the they are in Seattle, which was quite affected by Toronto blessing. And there was some kind of wacky deliverance practices um, that whether they came out of Toronto or they just people surrounding Toronto and that set charismatic wackiness. I've talked to a couple of people who were in that area during that time um, that saying that that's probably what he's talking about is he's not like because there are these kinds of deliverance sessions where you get a demon to come forward and you talk to them and you ask them why they got legal right and you ask them 30 different questions. And okay. You walk them through sanctification. Well, that yeah, might have been. So what I wonder if say. there is some context then. Uh, yeah. Because on the surface, you biblically, I mean, you can't cast out a demon without talking to it. Sure. You have to tell the demon to go. That is how you cast it out. Okay. All across the scripture. Okay. So if, if Driscoll was saying that, he's actually going against the Bible and undermining the authority we have in Christ to cast out demons. But if the context... Well, it seems like he did... Yeah. He let me both ways thought. on it, right? Yeah. But let me finish the thought. If the context was, maybe he wasn't saying never talk to the demon... Maybe what Driscoll was trying to say was something to the tune of, hey, listen, don't do a Q&A with demons where you're trying to find out like 30 questions from them. Because What's your favorite demons, color? I mean, I've told people that like, hey, I mean, don't trust a demon to give you accurate information. I, I mean, Jesus does ask a demon its name one time, one time. And that was another beef I had with the Driscoll's approach. It sounded like he wanted you to ask the demon name every time. I think that should be a minority of cases and very difficult ones. Uh, anyway, but, uh, so Jesus does ask a demon for information and that is one time, but I don't think we trust demons to give us accurate information most of the time, unless it's a really, a very spirit led moment. Agreed. But, uh, Miller, you were about to say something. So go ahead. Yeah. I just think I, I I'm agreeing with you. I think that's, that was Driscoll's approach is that there's times when demons will manifest and you have to deal with them directly. Uh, I don't know if I agree with the approach where you're trying to find a demon that's there and you're having the person sort of investigate to figure that out. Um, you know, I, I, I tend to like the model that Wimber uses of, you know, just praying and saying, Lord, hey, is there anything here? And then and then telling the person, hey, I could be wrong about this. Here's what I was, I was thinking. I think the problem with Driscoll is that he was so darn certain about everything. He would make a claim and, well, he had to be right, right? Because here's this man of God and, you know, he clearly has this gift and he's claiming this supernatural knowledge. That's not how you and I tend to approach things. You know, we tend to approach things as maybe it's this, I don't know. You know, I'm praying and sort of trying to figure this out and uh, I'm learning. Um, and so there's not much humility and it doesn't give people the room or freedom to disagree with him. Um, and I find that to be very dangerous. So, so would you say maybe like this specific statement, Miller, when if you'd stop believing the lies and believe God's truth, you'd be set free from the demons. Now, here's the deal. We don't know if that's a direct quote, if that's, ba it, we don't know, but, um, but if that's, it, it, maybe she's truncating the whole story as we do. That's not like a lie or anything. We, you know, she just, maybe she's we're truncating. We're not doubting Jen's story. Right. We're not doubting Jen's story, but maybe she's truncating it. But if he said it that briefly and abrasively, then I think that would be a bad way to go about it. One thing I've learned about casting out demons is it is it's a situation that you have to pastor. Uh, you have to care for the person. Um, you know, I'm thinking of uh, somebody recently in our church who uh, brought his his girlfriend in and wanted us to cast demons out of her, and um, he was screaming at her in tongues, and he was pointing his finger and like an angry voice. And he said, and then he sat her down. And he said, you can finish it off and cast out the demon. I was like, whoa, whoa. Um, I, I was like, she seemed like maybe she was demonized because she was acting weird. But at the same time, I just wanted to care for her in that situation. So yeah. I didn't, I didn't just go straight in and start casting out demons. We also separated the guy out because we deemed him to be uh, unhelpful, <laughs> unhelpful, actually abusive in that scenario. So we moved him uh, out of the room, and we just addressed her, and and we just, it, it actually did ultimately lead to some deliverance. It got there over a long period of time, and and mostly 
it was people just loving her and caring for her because she was in a very difficult situation. Now I share that story because here, if that's just if that's just truncated, that's fine. <laughs> that's fine. Maybe uh, Driscoll did a whole lot of pastoring on the front end that we weren't told about, but. Uh, but you really do when you're casting out demons, and anytime you minister, really have to pastor that situation well. And you don't have to be a, have a t pastor by your name to do that. It, this is yeah. really just what you call loving people, caring for them. Uh, and and mm -hmm. so if somebody came to me with deep sexual shame, uh, my first response would be, I'm so sorry. And, uh, and, and, just, and I would try to just work with them and hear them and listen to them. And if it came to deliverance, then we can go there. But uh, I, I do think we have to be careful about abrasiveness. Yeah, I would say that also on, on the tail end of that, believing lies isn't helpful. And it might not be demonic, but you'll certainly walk in a level of freedom and celebration and worship if you believe truth. Yeah. Um, so if someone is, is wallowing in depression, and that is, I mean, I've seen Miller do this a, feels like half a dozen times. Wallowing maybe, in depression? Where, yeah, I've seen you fall in depression, <laughs> well, and, and you know, and then we we get, we just have yeah, to tell you true. to believe the truth, and you you just perk right up. Um, no, I've seen him talk to people and being like, "Hey, you know, what's going on?" and and they'll say, "You know, I'm just I'm wrestling with this pain or that pain." Well, where did that happen? Well, it started happening around this time, very similar to the the boy who was brought to Jesus and throws himself in the water in the fire, and Jesus asks, "How long has this been happening?" Um, so we're we're investigating, we're doing that process of of how, uh, when did this emerge? And well, it happened back in this time. Has anything happened around that time that was really traumatic? Or yeah, this family member abused me, or this or that thing happened. And you're like, okay, you know, and you're praying about it. It's like, have you forgiven that person? You're just kind of investigating. You're just asking some questions. But the reality of the situation, maybe this isn't demonic at all. And you're walking in unforgiveness towards an individual, and your heart is hard towards God, repenting of your sin. Which, I mean, I'm, if something horrible happened to you as a child, like, I mean, God forbid, I'm so sorry that that happened. Pastor the moment, like Michael said. But then also go, you've got to live in freedom and forgiveness and truth. Right. And you can live in a level of liberty and just as a byproduct of believing what is true and, and living that out um, in, in right Christian practice of forgiveness and, uh, and repentance will cause a level of relief, joy, freedom, so, all of those yeah, things so in your life. Yeah, so you're affirming Driscoll's approach yeah. of... Repent of the lie, believe the truth. Whether and, it's demonic or not. Yeah. Good. But we have, all three of us, often found that this is actually a helpful approach to deliverance. Check out our other episodes on demons. We talked about 20 of them. Yeah, in July or, uh, or so, <laughs> somewhere around there, and June and August, right? But um, anyway, but uh, <laughs> repenting of the lies and believing the truth is a big part of it because when you open up your heart... And Michael, maybe you can help me remember, there was, there was a quote from the creative guy at the end that we should talk about maybe in this context. Yeah. But what I was going to say is, if you open up your heart to sin, um, then can a demon get a foothold? Absolutely. Ephesians 4, 26 to 27, in your anger do not sin, uh, and, do not give the uh, and don't let the sun go down on your anger, and do not give the devil a foothold. Let the sun go down on your anger, you get a demonic foothold. Saul, 1 Samuel 18, 9 to 10, turns a jealous eye toward David, verse, that's verse 9, I think it is, and then verse 10, right afterward, uh, an evil spirit comes upon Saul. And so uh, there's a direct connection to Saul's jealousy. So we can open doors to the demonic through our sins, where every sin at its root is because we're believing a lie. You see that in the foundational story of the fall, where Adam and Eve, where Eve uh, eats the fruit, she's believed Satan's lie, and that leads to the behavior. Every sinful behavior starts with a lie. Lie, sinful behavior, demon. Now, I'm not saying that demons come every time you sin. <laughs> I'm saying that they can, especially if it becomes like a, a kind of habitual deal. And just really briefly before I toss <laughs> it over to Miller for that creative, the guy's creative statement, or the guy in the creative department and his statement, um, be very clear, there are people who are tuning in that haven't watched our other episodes on uh, demon possession, demonology, if you will, for lack of a, a better term. Demon possession and demonization is something we have to touch on. Just real briefly, the idea that there is uh, Christians can be oppressed, but they can't be possessed. Well, that's that's an idea that's not found in Scripture anywhere. Uh, the word in the Scriptures is demonized, right? It's like if you turn a noun into a verb, theology, theologize, demon, demonized. So any kind of demonic activity whatsoever, the word in the, the, the Greek that is being used is demonized. So if someone had been possessed, legion was demonized. The woman who was hunched over was demonized. People who've been afflicted were demonized. So any kind of demonic activity whatsoever is the word 
demonized, okay? So that's to say that the word possession and oppression aren't biblical words. They're theological words that we read into the text. They're not in the text of Scripture itself. Um, so we would say, to Michael's point, uh, we don't want you to be oppressed, possessed, uh, don't make room for the devil, because if you do make room for the devil, the devil will somehow afflict you, demon possession. We want you right. to be free from that. So yep. that, that's our terminology. That's how we're using it. Those are the theological categories we're building off of. Miller, you want to you wanna jump in on there? Yeah, uh, there was something about that. Oh, Mike, when you mentioned, do not let the sun go down on your anger, do not give the devil a foothold, he was not saying in that moment that that guarantees you're going to get a demon. It just simply gives the devil an opportunity. I think that's right. the main point. Um, yeah. Is that any sin gives the devil the opportunity, and most sin is usually come starts with the wrong way of thinking. Um, so there's a quote at the very end of it where he interviews their creative director, and let me see. I don't know if you've got it, uh, if it's verbatim, Michael, but it was sort of like this. He says uh, he's talking about a five-year-old boy, and he's saying, you know, what did this five-year-old boy do that's so messed up that God just threw a bunch of demons at him? Um, and I, there's a problem with that way of characterizing it because I don't look at this and go, man, God is just waiting to pounce and punish some kid. That's, that's a great example of a straw man argument. Um, and it's the same kind of argument you see when people uh, um, bash penal substitutionary atonement, right? They'll say, oh, you know, God just is a cosmic child abuser and he had to abuse his son so that we could all be set free because he needs his pound of flesh. And that, that is not a good way to... To build an argument. And so, uh, granted, this is not Cosper doing this. This is somebody there doing this. And I think he he is responding to some of the abusive stuff that's going on at Mars Hill with Driscoll in particular and maybe some other leaders. But um, I don't think that that was the theology behind it. Um, I think, and I don't think, as far as I know, I don't know any charismatics um, or, or Pentecostals. I mean, maybe there are some out there, but the vast majority of them that I know would never say that that's what God's doing. He's just waiting for us to sin so we can throw a bunch of demons at us. What do you guys think about that quote? I thought that was a mis misrepresentation of charismatics. Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah. I mean, God has created a world in which sin has consequences. Yep. And when people sin, it opens up the doors to the door to demonic footholds. Now, if it's a five-year-old child, specifically, what catastrophic sin might the five-year-old child have committed? Probably nothing too catastrophic. Uh, I have seen, you know, there is the story, and, and you were talking about it earlier, uh, the kid that cast himself into the fire, into the water, and Jesus asks the question, how long has this been going on? When I'm praying over somebody that might be demonized or needs a healing, how long has this been going on is a really relevant question. Because what I've found is a lot of times, and it seems like this is what Jesus is getting at, the when the demon got in has something to do with how the demon got in. Um, so, uh, you know, like if eight years ago you started holding some massive grudge, you started to hate your spouse who divorced you, you know, whatever, you went through a terrible divorce and, and <coughs> started hating and had not unforgiveness, and then your life went to pot after that. Well, it's relevant. How long ago have you felt this arthritis in your hands? Well, since eight years ago. It had any, did anything happen just before then or around then? I got a massive divorce and I hate my husband, ex-husband. You know, those kind of things are relevant. So back to the the story with Jesus, that was a very that was a difficult demon to to cast out. I might be mixing stories here. I can't remember, but I'm I'm doing this fast. But um, I think that's the one where Jesus says this kind comes out only with prayer. With the boy. Uh, yeah, with yeah, the boy. The boy throws yeah, in the fire and the water. One. Yeah, same yeah, one. Yeah, uh, this kind only comes out with prayer. This kind. So there are different kinds. Yeah. Uh, Matthew 12 speaks of certain spirits being more wicked than other spirits. So um, this kid had a demon since childhood, and uh, it seemed to be a particularly wicked demon that, that required uh, a lifestyle of prayer in the background uh, to be able to move in that kind of authority. And so um, all of that to say, I, I think it's relevant to ask those kinds of questions, yep. and, uh, and and I think that the creative director's statements were maybe a little bit naive about how these things work sometimes. Yeah, and I think that there's a, uh, in the around the 45-minute mark, there is a, a similar, a seemingly causation um, from this language of suffering. I think that the, the moderator is afraid that uh, charismatic leaders, and in, in of which I can just affirm, and I can just agree with his fear, um, that your suffering is caused by your sin. Stop sinning, believe what is true, and you'll stop suffering. 
That is a legitimate fear. Don't tell people that the suffering in their life is caused by their sin. But at the same time, don't tell people that their suffering is just the cosmic. I mean, if you have slept with 60 people in your lifetime and your, your body counts at 60, you know, and you contract some kind of sexually transmitted disease and you're suffering because of your sin, like that's, that's an actual consequence. We, Romans we have to speaks admit to that. the reality that people do suffer because of sin. Yes, but not all suffering is due to sin, right? So it's, it's, a, it's, it's not a always a one-to-one -one connection. Exactly. So I would affirm his uh, fear that charismatic leaders would speak to people saying that their, that their suffering is caused by their sin and that all of their suffering is a byproduct of their sin. But I would want to um, still affirm that sin actually yeah. has consequences yeah. and can cause suffering. I want to come on the heels of this, and Miller, I want to ask you a question. Um, so Cosper criticized, and I have a, this is a quote paraphrase here, but uh, I just, I was typing as the podcast was going, but this is pretty much what he said. Uh, he criticized, quote, ish. Prying to find the darkest secrets and deepest wounds is dangerous, he says. I spoke with a trauma-informed therapist who is deeply concerned this process normally takes two years it's deeply scarcing scarring so, sorry it's it was really fastly typing yeah it's deeply scarring to uh to force this this being the deep searching of the secrets and the possible traumas that might be behind this so uh so miller what do you think of that is there a genuine concern here? I mean, a trauma-informed therapist is saying, hey, you can't do a single deliverance session for two hours asking somebody to dig into the nether regions of their heart and the darkest corridors and bring it all out and cast all the demons out and everybody is happy now. Um, is this criticism, or we might call it a caution, criticism or caution from Cosper warranted? Uh, I actually think it is warranted. Um, I, I, I'm trying to think how I, I can agree and disagree in this. You do see Jesus with the woman at the well, right? How many, you know, go, get, go back and get your husband. And she's like, I have no husband. He's like, well, you say correctly you have no husband. For in fact, you've had five husbands and the man you're with now is not your husband. I mean, that, that is exposing somebody's sinful pattern. Um, that's a deeply held secret. Now, uh, I, I think that, you know, God provides insight and words of knowledge. I don't necessarily know about Mark Driscoll's visions of pornographic images. I'm not really sure, you know, about yeah, that. Yeah, to come back to that. Um, so, so there is a sense in which God does reveal people's sin, but it's not to condemn them. It's to set them free. It's so that they can be forgiven and cleansed by the blood of the Lord. Um, and yet I do think if you're trying to take an inventory and just pry in and sort of force your way into somebody's secrets, you're already off. Um, I, I just don't think that's how, how God uh, does things without it being, uh, without there being this great, deep sense of care and concern. And so I think, um, so I, I guess I'm not quite saying yes or no. I'm saying, you know, I, I agree with them that that can actually traumatize people, forcing your way into their trauma when they're not ready to share it. Um, but I can also disagree in the sense that sometimes God will, you know, step in in a moment of time and set something, someone free of something that they weren't, they didn't know that that was going to happen. Um, so, yeah, I don't know if that helped you guys. Sorry for the wishy-washy yeah. answer there. Yeah, no, okay. Yeah, I think it is a both hand because I do think that it's dangerous. I mean, you get like lay people in there just like doing some demon casting out and that they, they maybe don't have a lot of experience with it. And they're going to like sift through the corridors of people's hearts. I mean, that's, that is a dangerous thing uh, for sure. And I think we need to be careful. And, uh, and so I think what I would say is, uh, but I would also balance that out with this, that I've actually seen a lot of fruit from this, even from people not that experienced. And, um, and so here, here's how I would recommend going about it. First of all, the first thing you always do is you listen you just listen to the person. Just how are you doing? And and, and and then and you show empathy. I'm so sorry you're going through the you, again that pastoral work on the front side. You always do those things first. Um, but but besides that, when you get into sort of the prayer Holy Spirit time, um, I, I think what I would say is instead of give me a review of every bad thing that's happened and let's talk about it all, I, I would say. Let the Holy Spirit... Now, Philippians 3 talks about, it says, 
hey, press on toward the prize. But if anyone doesn't have this view, the uh, you know, just ask God and he'll reveal it to you wherever you're falling short. Yep. So it, this is actually a promise from God that he'll reveal to us that. And so, it, and specifically that is, is issues from the past that are kind of holding us back from pressing forward. So I would just ask, I just ask the Holy Spirit and I teach my teams, listen, we don't, the, the formula is ask God. That's the formula. Okay. And, and so we ask the Holy Spirit, is there any memory that you want to speak into? Is there anything from the past that you, uh, any memory from the past that you want to speak into? And what I've found is that there is no healing power like the voice of God. And when God speaks into somebody's past trauma, and God is the one who actually brought up the trauma in the meeting, and so you, you have a prayer time, Holy Spirit, would you speak to us? Is there anything you want to speak? And, and they're saying, hey, well, I just saw this memory come to mind. Okay, well, does the Lord want to speak into that memory at all? And when the, when the Holy Spirit speaks into that moment, it can have tremendous uh, healing effects. Okay, so I, uh, Miller, I should you have something? also mention one other thing. Yeah, well, I think bad counseling can also have a very negative effect. Agreed. Um, not just bad deliverance practices. And so I understand that some people, it does take two years for them to get certain things out. I, I think there's also bad counseling that gets things out preemptively and forcefully. Um, and that even when those things are divulged, people respond in a way that's actually shaming, condemning, condemning. Not that I'm saying the, the, you know, counseling practice would agree with it, but, but that happens too. There's also bad counseling, not just bad deliverance. You know, Miller, we only have two thumbs downs on this video and one of them came where you were just talking. <sighs> Rough. Rough. <laughs> um, man, he's probably gonna need counseling gonna for that later. Healing for him. Uh, um, okay, so... Um, you, Miller mentioned a reference of pornographic visions, which certainly places my job in a hard light now that I have to explain what that is. Um, <laughs> uh, so, so Mark explains, he has these counseling sessions where God speaks to him, right? Uh, and, you know, Mark is one of the um, pioneers, I would say, for the Young Restless Reform Movement, though he claims he was never reformed. Is ironic, um, Did but he, say he never was. Yeah, he said he was never a Calvinist. Um, <laughs> which okay, whatever. Uh, uh, um, so, and and I think if if we're going to be absolutely a hundred percent honest, you know, he came up with this position on limited, unlimited atonement. So, if you're going to define Calvinism by the five points of Calvinism, technically, sure, he wasn't. He was a an Almoraldian. He was a four point Calvinist. But neither here nor there. Um, uh, looks like a duck, quacks like a duck, Calvinist. Anyway, um, in this, he's talking about these counseling sessions where he's having these dialogues with people. Uh, they're they're going through a divorce, I think he said, or they're they're having a hard time in uh, in their marriage. And as he is talking to them, he said it was like a movie, you know, fell down out of heaven, and he was just watching this movie as she was talking. And uh, the way the story goes is he sees a blonde-haired Fabio figure uh, with her at some event and she, he, she, they go back to his place, hotel room or whatever, have sex together. I mean, he goes as specific to say, left the light on because you wanted him to see you and you to see him. And, and he climbed on top of you. I mean, he, he uses guys. I apologize. I should have told you if you're listening to this with kids, you should have turned this off. I apologize. I typically do that. But, um, you know, he tells this story that's, that's pretty graphic, frankly, on how she committed adultery, not just that she committed adultery, but how she did it. Um, and, and that's all the detail that we got from the story. Now, the response of the narrator is this, let's make it clear. This is a claim that the Holy Spirit is inspiring pornographic visions of adultery, sexual abuse, or, or, and, and sexual abuse of children, because he, he goes on to say, this happens of people who've been raped, children who've been raped, and I'll go and confront this person, talk to this person, finds out that it was true. In fact, that did happen and not just a word of knowledge. So it seems as if the narrator would say, hey, it seems to be within God's you know, uh, within God's nature, that if he was going to speak to his people, he would do it in this like kind of chill, hey, Michael, this person's, you know, a predator and is going after kids and a nice like calm whisper and not with a visible image of what was happening. That seems to be the kind of inference that I'm getting from this individual. So, so we have to ask the question, could God speak this way? And what do we think about that? Could God speak in a pornographic vision? I mean, again, the, the, assumption is that we, we're using the word pornographic and that has prepackaged language in it 
right. if if he was seeing the act of someone being seduced. Right. Okay. So, I could God. I'll, I'll say it this way: Would God speak through a pornographic vision? No, I don't think he would ever personally, because I think pornography is a sin. So why would God put that into somebody's mind? Okay. Now, what a, it, if if my goal was to show Mark grace in this? Now, first of all, I don't think he should have shared all that detail the way he did. So there's delivery. I think that's an issue. But second of all, if I was seeking to show Mark some grace in in what he said, okay, I think Cosper's intuition might be right, and that is kind of what it sounded like. It sounded like Driscoll was sa- describing a pornographic vision. On the other hand, I think it's possible that what Driscoll was uh, was describing was when he said things like, "and I saw, uh, and I saw the the couple," you know. I, didn't he say I saw him have sex or something like that? Or I saw them. I don't know if he went to that even that extent, but I, I know that in other visions he I saw I saw a woman get raped or whatever. I'm just with some experience in the visionary world. I just know that uh, to see someone, you know, to say I saw someone get raped, doesn't necessarily mean you saw it pornographically. He might be saying, even when he says I saw everything. I mean, it does sound a little pornographic. But again, if I'm trying to say, show grace, it's possible that, like, God showed, like, shadows, like, basically gave the impression that that's what was happening without actually showing it. Yeah, I've seen a lot of movies where there's not an explicit pornographic scene, but you see individuals kissing, they go off screen, and and you know what's happening. And then it shows feet. Or... A light switch turned off or whatever right. like so could it have been something could have been a pg-13 could it have been a, like a tasteful song of solomon esque? <laughs> that's what i'm saying like <laughs> like pornographic like that is that is assuming and prepackaging certain language into the conversation that is i don't know it, but here's here's but my it thing is, it did sound like that you've got a couple of options right here's the options one mark had an actual vision that he embellished right for the sensational kind of i know great details and i Mm -hmm. I can pinpoint you on this so it was an embellishment two uh it's a lie this didn't happen at all uh three it was a demon right in which case this woman repented of her sin and her and her husband reconciled i have a hard time thinking it's a demon okay or four that god in fact did speak to him in this way and we are misconstruing how it actually happened Okay, so so the the grand scheme, I mean, if it was absolute nudity and intercourse that he witnessed, I have a hard time believing that's God, too. I'm right there with you and saying if that if that's what he saw, that wasn't God. Right. But I didn't hear that he necessarily saw pornographic images. What I heard was he, in a visionary sense, saw that people certainly, you know, did what they did. But. Could it have been sort of bleeped out by God or, you know, uh, implied by God? I don't know. Possibly. Here, here's the thing, guys. If this story is true, okay, and, and, and let's say let's say I'm in a, a situation, I'm in this church, and I'm hearing these stories of chairs levitating, and I'm hearing these stories of, uh, you know, women who their, their, their sexual experience have been foreseen or seen i guess with it it's back in the back it's not foreseen in the future but there, there, he's, he sees all these things that are happening in great explicit detail and they repent and believe and people are being healed and these are these big claims i would go to my pastor to my elders and be like i want to know those stories show me those stories the the uh this is a great moment to talk about uh, elijah stevens documentary called send proof which is all about documenting these things as charismatics we've kind of left our brain at the door and said hey we're just going to believe all of these testimonies as if we live you know in the 20s the 1920s and we don't have some kind of medical documentation to follow up with these things we we need to investigate we need to verify these stories we need to verify these claims we need to look into these things so um some of these claims can't be investigated but others i think the ones that were just given right now could have been investigated and we could ask that young lady did this happen and if she goes yeah i did repent of my sin then i go man that was god because i don't think mark could conjure that up and i don't think a demon is going to conjure something up to cause someone to to repent of their sin i mean the claim was that it was accurate so Um, so that's that's the process but if it was truly pornographic i would say no it wasn't god i just am not so sure that it really actually was pornographic 
I don't know. But but my, my point is that how okay, so we're talking about this story in the past. How does that affect our life now? Well, right now, if you're hearing stories like this, do something about it. Investigate. His point was, how do we know if these are actual fairies or paper fairies, right? How do we know these are actual miracles or fabricated stories of a charismatic leader? Investigate. Do the work. Put some some effort into it. Get some firsthand accounts. Get some testimonies under your belt. Figure this stuff out. I think that's that would be yeah. my takeaway. Miller, Josh, and I have been going back and forth. Any thoughts? You're like, are you commenting in the comment no, section? No, I'm... I'm reading it. It's pretty crazy right now. Uh, no, I'm I'm in agreement with both of you. Um, I, I tend to think, I so the thing is, I don't think God would give Driscoll a vision that's pornographic in nature. I do think God probably spoke to to Driscoll about. It. I mean, if if the whole story that Driscoll tells is true, then I have no problem with God telling Driscoll somebody's committed adultery. Like I think God does that. Um, and if the person got free, then praise God that that happened. I think the uh, the podcast, I, I have a concern that um, this was a bit more smearing of Driscoll than is normal, um, though, I, and I have to say that he definitely was abusive. There's some really bad stuff in there. Um, I think the point is, is that there's some stuff that he may have done that is actually really helpful. Helping people get set free from demonic entities happens. If Driscoll did that, then I commend him for setting people free. Could he have done it yeah. in a way that wasn't abusive? Absolutely. And I would encourage and admonish him to do as such and anybody out there that's doing it in an abusive way. Sorry, yeah. I'm kind of rambling now. That's it. Yeah. That's all no, my thoughts. <laughs> we, we, there needs to be more investigation on these kinds of things, okay? We need to know, hey, if you're watching this right now and you're the lady who had said affair and you wanted to somehow verify this story, um, we would want to know, you know, reach out to us, let us know so that we can kind of investigate and move forward on this kind of thing. Um, these these stories, because they took place in a vacuum a decade ago, I don't know if we're going to be able to find these kinds of right. things. And, and, and just this is what you'll find with us on, here on Remnant Radio yeah. is we're really going to try to give Christian brothers and sisters and honestly just people made in the image of God the benefit of the doubt where we can. That's right. And so... It sounded like he was describing pornographic images, but there is a chance that it wasn't. And so we don't want to necessarily slander him by saying that That's it right. absolutely was that. That's what we're trying to be careful about. Um, we hate much of what happened at Mars Hill under Mark Driscoll's leadership and abuse. We hate it. We despise it. It's a, a stench in God's nostrils, much of the abuse that happened at Mars Hill. But uh, I don't want to slander things that I don't understand or know. So, yeah, I agree. Uh, okay, I think there's one more question. We're about on, on time, but one more question I think we really need to address because it was a big element in the show. And, and the point that Cosper was making like was, hey, repeatedly, in, in some form or another, he said this, uh, guys, it's a recipe for abuse when you claim to hear from God and you're also a spiritual authority, okay? You claim to hear from God. So the point was, Driscoll had these stories. Driscoll, and, and Jen said it at the beginning, I believed Mark saw something in me <laughs> that maybe I didn't. So I opened myself up to him. And and so the point is, hey, when charismatics have you know stories about demons going and chairs floating and all the things, then it's a recipe for spiritual abuse. True or false, what do you think? Um, I think Jesus and the apostles all had gifts and they claim to hear from God and it wasn't a recipe for spiritual abuse. I, I do think that anyone in any position of leadership that has an ungodly um, heart can have spiritual abuse. They don't even have to be charismatic for that. Uh, frankly, I think this problem arose because uh, Mark became a celebrity overnight, um, pushed accountability away from him, became the sole pastor with no plurality of elders, was able to do things without any checks or balances. And whether he is opening a Bible and reading a Bible verse and telling you what it means or saying that he's somehow has some secret knowledge of prophecy, uh, all of the above, um, are when you have a bad heart, abuse. you have, you have a recipe for abuse. And if those all power and all authority, is yeah, a was that classic saying of absolute or power corrupts and absolute power corrupts. Absolutely. Like you want to live in a place where you're submitted to people so that when you begin to embellish, when you begin to tell stories that are just not quite accurate, that those people who are in your life can actually hold you actually accountable and not just like, oh yeah, I'm submitted to these people, but also if they cross me, I will fire them. Like that's not a good place to be in. Yeah. Uh, Miller, what do you think? 
Uh, there you I go. don't have any more thoughts. Uh, yeah, sorry, I don't. I don't really have any other thoughts on this. I, I think you guys hit the nail on the head there. Um, I yeah. Think I, okay. You know, the one, uh, one thing again, I, I think it was sad was the, the fact that, and this is just me commenting. He didn't give those women the space to grieve. He just assumed they were gossiping. It's like, man, when you've when you've had a major fallout. Like you've got to give that space to people in general and don't assume it's gossip. And there probably needs to be some conversation in church about what is gossip and what is talking about and processing things because those two things are different, um, yeah. but they can look and the same. One, one more topic that was really big in the episode that we're just not going to address. Uh, Sam Storms got a lot of time on the episode to address when Mark Driscoll claimed that like, women are more demonized than men oh my god that, that was, was horrible yeah that was awful said. so outlandish and ridiculous and based on misinterpretations of first timothy 2 and first peter 3 terrible interpretations of those Agreed. passages uh and murdering those passages anyway um and drawing the conclusion that women are more demonized what what a not just silly but ridiculous thought but sam storm's got a lot of air time to address that so go you guys go back and watch the watch the podcast episode. Uh, Josh and Michael, what are y'all's closing thoughts? Uh, I want to spend my closing talks responding to Rated R Reformed. Uh, this statement here says, I'm not your brother if you think God speaks Dude, to I you. Dude, I was about to call uh, that out too. Well, I'm glad I you just, did. I want to I want to I want to take the time. Uh, first of all, um, <laughs> take I take my closing thought with that one too. <laughs> okay, okay. So, I'm just going to respond for Go everybody. ahead, go for it. Uh, Rated R Reformed. Let's let's just have a conversation, he, buddy. He's um, not a brother with anyone in the early church. Well, yeah. Anyone so, in church like Church history before, okay. No, no it's okay, get it's your, okay. Get your closing um, thought. I, I understand um, the caution and the concern that you have on this subject. Um, if you believe that God speaks to you, I'm not your brother. The idea that there's some kind of open canon and that we're all going to speak in some way that is infallible uh, and that is going to be binding on the conscience for all people everywhere, that we're raising up for ourselves little popes who can speak with infallible authority. And no one here believes that. Uh, we are charismatics and, and we do believe that God speaks and that the way he speaks is a way that is to be submitted to the local church that has been in effect since Jesus ascended on high and gave gifts to men. Uh, we would hold the passage to, in Joel chapter 2, we poured out his spirit on all flesh, talking about the last days, and we are in those last days today. What makes me a Christian is not whether I believe God speaks or doesn't speak today, uh, but that I believe that Jesus Christ is the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, Amen. God of God, light of light, true God from true God, uh, I, that I believe that Jesus Christ is born of a virgin, uh, lived a sinless life, died on the cross for the penal substitutionary atonement of my sins and the sins of the world. And those who believe in him don't perish and have eternal life. He died, rose from the dead, uh, seated in heaven right now next to the throne of God. Uh, this, this kind of conversation of like, hey, if you differ with me on charismatic conversations, you're not a Christian, I think is a woefully ignorant thing to say. I think that you're despising prophecy. You're forbidding the speaking of tongues. You're actually uh, clearly running in the face of the scriptures that command you not to do these things. Um, I think that you're in error, but I wouldn't call you not a brother because if you hold to those things I stated prior that you are a Christian brother and, and to kind of divide the body of Christ over these kinds of secondary tertiary issues, uh, I think is quarrelsome and divisive. And I would really advise you to repent of that. It, it's not healthy. Uh, and man, it just, it, it causes division in the body. Uh, we can agree to disagree on the charismata. I, I get that. Um, man, but, but we can't agree to disagree on Dude, the cross. So. I'm slow clapping. Slow you clap. Okay. Slow okay. clap. Slow well, clap. That's, that. that's it. Yeah. I, I have no Wherever closing comments. Yeah, I mean, they're probably like driving in a car. I like. Oh. Uh, <laughs> make mention don't, don't. of the conference October fourth through the sixth, or third through the sixth, down at Woods Edge Church. That's going to be a lot of fun. Pursuit is the name of it. Woods Edge Church, October third yeah. through sixth. So, yeah, go go check out Pursuit Conference. Um, we, me and Miller, are going to be in Louisiana. I'll post a graphic of that. Uh, probably on Friday, you guys can see we're going to be out there speaking at a at a house of prayer. Louisiana, uh, it's going to be fun. Louisiana. Anyway, blessings, guys. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Remnant Radio. Tons of really great content to come out on. Maybe maybe if you're out there and you're like, man, did the early church fathers talk about prophecy and how to discern prophecy outside of the biblical canon? 
Well, that's Turns really interesting that you did. mentioned. They did. And we just did an episode on that two weeks ago. Uh, how did the early church fathers, the patristic period, the first brothers. 300 years of the church, who we have received the faith from, whom I think would be brothers, they wrote on this stuff in the Didache, in the Shepherd of Hermas, in the Acts of the Holy Apostles. There's tons of literature on the early church about discerning these things. You can go check that out on a former episode. Anyway, blessings, guys. We'll catch you later. See you next time. Subscribe. Subscribe. Give on Patreon. Links in the description. Thanks for the reminder.